Good Wednesday evening or morning or afternoon. And in some places, in some places already, already Thursday. Um, how y'all are? We're good. 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 Speaking for the viewership as a whole, we are good. Yeah. And speaking of viewership, we've, we've got some of the usual suspects already commenting. Are John sure? Longshore. Um, don't let them in. Don't let them in. Um, Chuck says hi. Hey, John Longshore up? waves. Uh, Chuck says John being safe? Question mark. Uh, uh, Dave Hall says ta ta. Yeah, that was that's from Matt. Um, for those that did not see him just go live uh, briefly uh, a couple of minutes ago, he is. I'm not going to say calling it quits. But he is going to be going on to an extended hiatus. Um, the Rockies War Room channel will still be there. You can still go uh, look back at the three years of jackassery <clears throat> that we had going on there uh, and all of his other stuff. Um, but as he said, come see me. Come see me. Um, so, And y'all are here. Uh, John says playability because accuracy is out of the window and off the rails at the end of the first turn. Uh, and we're going to get into that, John. We're, we will get into that. Uh, and John says, oh, so true. Sir. Chuck says, John, oh, so true, sir. Uh, John, safe. Pretty much my wife has me locked in the attic. I'd call 911, but don't have a phone. Well, there you go. Um, okay, the cops would get to your door. She'd say you're fine, and then they'd leave. Yeah. Uh, Chuck says, I understand. In my case, it's home self-arrest with both my doors locked so grandkids uh, or nobody can get in to bother me. Nice. Uh, got uh, Joanna. Says, Hi, my friends. Hello, Joanna. Thank you for joining us. And right, Matt says, jackass. Lol. Hey, there's yes. two of us here. Jackasses. Uh, yeah, that's plural. Jackass. Uh, we do have seven viewers, so viewers, thank you one and all. And tonight, we are talking about the balance of, uh, and speaking of balance, here comes Hex to Hex. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, Hello, I'm Jeff. Having, Jeff uh, and I are having to play channel hopscotch here because I'm dumb. I that's okay. Hey, you guys do you, man. Uh, we got two action Steve here. Oh, so, right. hey, fellas. Hey, Steve. Uh, happy belated birthday again. Yeah. Stevie at the um, big 5 0. Yeah, he did. Welcome to the club, Junior. Welcome to the club. Um, so, we're, we're going to talk about not which is better or what, what's really more important. I want to talk about the balance and how we can best get to it between what we would consider reality in, in historical uh, meaning. Uh, and that historical could be actual history, you know, actual setup of the peninsular war of uh, uh, or the peninsular battles in, of the early 1800s. Uh, or it could be the history of Star Wars, you know, that type of stuff. That is always um, my favorite when people say that it's not accurate and stuff like Star Wars or 40K. And it's like, dog, yeah, are flying through space. Like, come on. Yeah. So, but, you know, the balance between the, the historically accurate and the playability. Uh, and I, I saw a couple of comments on um, YouTube um, not YouTube, Facebook, uh, saying, well, you know, if you're not having fun, do something else. It, it's, it's not about having fun. It's, it's about the playability. Yeah. Jay, we're not here to have fun. No, it wasn't Jay actually. Oh, it wasn't. Okay. No, I thought it was uh, like a Jay Wiley thing, but no, we're not here to have fun. Miniatures are not for fun. Yeah. John says Rocky's war room needs to direct their viewers to your channel in his, in his uh, video, John, he did, uh, he did, um, and it that meant a lot to me. Matt uh, is a good friend, uh, 
and uh, he did. And, and Matt is saying so himself. He did, and he will. Uh, Chuck said, Fifty babes in the woods, wait till 66 and three quarters. Yeah. That's, that sounds like a – that sounds like a record speed. Yeah, what? A you lost it there, Chuck, but I love it, buddy. <laughs> yeah, wait until you hit 33 and a third or 72. And then uh, John says, that's good because not Jay has now five more subscribers than his nephew. That's oh, right, what? sucker. Every one of you go like or go subscribe to Joseph Arnold. You're killing me. You're killing Every me. Every one of you. Anyway, so the the thing, and, and I think balance between playability and historical accuracy is almost more keyed to board games um, because where do you? where you run into issues with you know being very historically accurate uh, compared to being very playable runs into uh, issues when you're dealing with a very focused uh, situation such as playing uh, D-Day you know, storming the beaches of Normandy, or you're you're playing uh, Guadalcanal, etc. It's a little fuzzier miniatures gaming, um, but again, all you have to do is go look at quote unquote historical war gaming, <clears throat> and there is a wide array of historical accuracy compared to playability. Uh, I would have to say that second edition uh, Flames of War was a fairly playable game. The, the playability level of the game is high um, because it was a good game to play. But although the individual vehicles and the individual units had a basis in history because of the type of game that is normally played with fistful of, or not fistful, what good Lord flames with of flames of war. See, I always have fistful of lead on the brain, right? Because it's my absolute favorite game. And Cause you can play bigger battles using single bases and flames of war instead of individual figures. Yeah. And then use exactly the same unit organization mm -hmm. add in flames of war in bigger battles. Yeah. Yes. So, Did that. uh, <clears throat> but uh, Flames of War might, like I said, have its its units based in history, has its vehicles based in history, but because of the type of play you normally get with Flames of War, historically accurate does not come to mind. See, this is always the thing with, so talking about, yeah, because, you know, Flames of War, at its core was still a, hey, we're going to make this tournament compatible, right? Right. Um, which is one of those... That's that's where miniatures gaming hits its biggest accuracy thing for me, right? Because if you're playing... Say you're, you know, your first lieutenant, Chris, right? Your first lieutenant, not Jay. And you're taking your platoon to take a Hamlet or something. And First Lieutenant Hexy over there, or Oberleutnant, or Leutnant Jeffy over there, and as the Germans is sitting in that village, you know, and he's got his platoon, and you got your platoon, right? That's, that's a war game right there. Yeah. In real life, that's the dumbest idea you've ever fucking had. <laughs> That is the dumbest thing that second that first lieutenant Chris has ever thought of. First exactly. lieutenant Chris is going to go get first lieutenant Todd, and you know, second platoon as well, and then he's <clears> going to go try and find you know, he's going to go back to to the mess and find Lieutenant Brian, 
Yep. Right. Who's back making tacos in the mess tent. <clears throat> um, and then he's going to go find, you know, Lieutenant Bain with his, you know, armored platoon. And then they're going to go back to that village and kick the bejesus out of second or out of Lloyd and Jeffy and his crowds. Right. Right. And so that's always the issue with, for me with, with miniatures games and stuff is that if, again, the only good fight is one that is not fair. Like the only good, the only fight you should ever put yourself into is one that's not fair. So otherwise, exactly. Why would you do something that takes like, oh well, there's a significant chance that I'm going to lose this. What? No. That yeah. Makes, exactly. That, yeah. That makes a terrible like you know way to go through life. Uh, usually because you know life tends to disappear when you got a 50 50 chance of living or dying. Like, who's going to yeah. play? Uh, Who's going to play Russian roulette with a double barrel shotgun? Nobody. So that's a terrible idea. Right. Exactly. You know, and that's what um, I run into that with miniatures games. So Steve says playing uber accurate games are okay. It's the jack wagons that you're playing with. Gamey gamersons are, are war game vampires. They will suck all life and playability out of any game. Exactly. Uh, my brother uh, comes in with playability and accuracy are not mutually exclusive. And I never said that they were. Correct. I'm just saying that there there is a balance. Um, the issue that is people tend when to you find. go for one exclusively at the expense of the other. Right? right. That's what I tend to find is you find there there are people and and not everybody's like this, but there are people who say, "Oh, I want a super playable game," and then like everything falls by the wayside, or I want a super accurate game, and that's all it's focused on, and then the game's like, "Right, oh, come on." And there is there is a happy medium where you can have a highly playable game with a significantly accurate event. Oh, oh yeah, very well. So, um, and then he says, you can't be any more wrong. I can't believe you're so wrong after all the discussions we've had on this topic. Uh, I'll, I'll let him elaborate. I'm sure um, he's talking to you. Oh, he's absolutely my, talking to me. My tragically oversimplified analysis of everything is absolutely infallible. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> You're exactly right, Jay. John, John says, historical simulations are best done reading a book that persuades you to play a playable game. Otherwise, you'll need a novel anyway to understand the simulation. Th and there is a bit of truth to that, John. I, I agree. Um I have all the Flames of War books, mostly for the TONEs. Very good resource. John, exactly, man. Yes. Especially that golden age, at like the middle to end of second edition, start of third edition, when they were coming out with Cobra and Villiers, Bocas, yes. and all those. Yes. God, not only that, but they are just beautifully put together books. And they've got really good, just... See, I don't know. Battlefront... Sorry, I'm about to fanboy real quick. Go I'm ahead. Old Battlefront, because I'm not a huge fan of new Battlefront. But... Battlefront's books used to be some of the best resource books I've ever read because they managed to hit the highlights. They weren't like the... So in, in the Old Fights War books, you'd have kind of a summary of this unit's actions in this particular theater, right? And we're not talking as like incredible as Two Fat Lardy's Pint Size Campaigns, which right. are <laughs> beyond incredible. Um but at the same time, it's far better than, you know, um, what you'll get in a book from, say, Warlord. Even their theater books, which are, to Warlord's credit, better than um, their old books. Um, they can't touch the Flames of War books. And then, again, the organizations are fantastic. And I know they're not perfectly um, accurate because, yeah, you can get all kinds of stuff. But it does a good way of explaining, okay... In this theater, if you are, you know, an infantry company in the or in the first infantry division, here's yeah, the equipment that the first infantry division might have been able to provide you, right? Or what you might have been able to draw on from corps or army level. Yeah, um, we got uh, uh, Chris Long A. Hello, all. How you doing, A? Warmut tostadas. But both historically accurate and very edible. So yeah, true. Which is a rarity in war games. When most of the time, if you are wanting to be historically accurate, you'd all be sitting there cracking teeth on hardtack. 
Um, then Jay says, the main determination of accuracy is whether or not the decisions in a game are appropriate to the level of command the players are taking. Yeah, absolutely. It, it too, yes. Um, that and, you know, not rolling in, you know, with 12 tigers that are infallible and, and, and work 100% of the time. Um, <laughs> to play uh, a game of bolt action where somebody brought two mouse. Like, wait a minute, what? They never even built a second turn for that one. You can't do, yeah. Yeah. I definitely played in uh, played in that bolt action game where it was just, I rolled up to a tournament and somebody had two mouse and it was just like, this is. Why? This is like, why, why are you the way that you are? Yeah. And why is the way you are a dick? Yeah, exactly. Like, um, <laughs> come on, man. <laughs> How can you have any pudding if you don't eat your meat? There you go. Yeah. Um, it's also a question of whether you want accuracy in the process to find a result or you want accuracy in the result. That <clears throat> is a huge thing that yeah. Todd and I talk about all the time. Yeah. And, and my, my brother is, is being very emphatic here. You're asking the wrong questions. Are we, though? Um, are says, we just okay, I'm putting Junior Wargamer to bed before I have an aneurysm. Hey, See, this is Jay. That maybe that's the point. Maybe uh, the, the, your brother is, is intentionally asking the questions to piss you off because he's your brother. Or you know, that's this it. is this is my show, and these are the questions that I want to ask. If if you know, you, you've had your show, you've asked these questions. It's my turn. Yeah, for those of you who want this as an academic study, the veteran wargamer has done absolutely fantastic interviews yes. on this topic. Yeah, he, he's much better at doing this stuff than I am. He's very he he is much better at being analytical. I'm here for the dog and pony show. Meanwhile, we're over here sniffing glue and drawing pictures of burgers and then eating the paper. So exactly, exactly. You know, there's that. Um, and Chris Long A is laughing his ass off. Uh, two mouse, what the fuck? <laughs> Needs a smack to the head. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Robbie from Japan. Hey, buddy. Uh, yeah, it, it's a sad day. Um, so uh, where got you, Mister Robot Roberto? Nice, nice. Not that, um, was, that was terrible. Don't, don't give me, don't encourage that behavior. <laughs> hey, that's what they come for. That's what they come for. Um. Yeah, it, it is a bit of a sad day that uh, that Rocky has hung up the hung up the gloves, so to speak. But you know what? Hey, we, we will do our best to to fill in. Um, if the Nazis want to play two mice, then the Americans should be entitled to a pl platoon of T twenty nine heavy tanks. John, all I want is Panzer fours for my fins. That's all. It's not hard. Panzer fours and Landsbergs. That's all I want. But no. There you go. There you World go. It's too busy putting mice in the <clears> game <throat> and IS threes and shit and all that. So the ultimate on the field battle. Let, let's minimize this a little bit. Let's go with something that there was mass of. Let's go with a bunch of PZ four H's versus T thirty four seventy sixes. Why? Now Why you got are a gun, you so... Now you got a mobile gunfight. Yeah, you do. You do. I was about to say. I, yeah. I was. I don't remember who it was, but I've seen a couple <clears> of <throat> blogs, one of which was very, very well done, documenting a dude's progression towards a chunk of Kursk in three millimeter to be played at a one-to-one -one scale. Which which isn't accurate because you don't have the infantry flying all over the place. You just had the numbers of tanks that he could find in one place. And it was just one of those, damn, that's cool. But... Um, just to touch really quick on Jay's thing with the accuracy of the process versus the accuracy of the result. It always really frustrates me. And I know we've talked about this when people use, you know, well-known engagements um, to see, to, to quote, test a rule system like for Anglo Zulu, like, Oh, well, will Rorch drift turn out the same way? Rorch drift should not turn out the same way. Right when you have these like insanely heroic or insanely lucky things that happen, if your war game accurately predict or creates those results every time, you're there's something wrong. You're forcing a result that that shouldn't happen. Right, like 
the British should not win Rourke Strift as your litmus test for a game. Right. You know. Um, so, yeah, and, and th- this is one of the things that, you know, Jay and I have talked about a lot. And it is what, for us, what's more fun, the result or the process? And I'm a results player. So if the game provides me with the correct decisions or allows me, I should say, allows me to make decisions at the correct level, and I'll explain what I mean here in a second, and provides me with a historically plausible outcome, a historically plausible uh, result, um, then... To me, that is an infinitely more fun game than I'm I'm jumping through hoops to you know get to my result um, because I'm having to roll dice after dice after dice after dice after dice because I'm going from step one to step two, step three to step four. Um, so. And what I mean by making decisions at the right level, again, you have to look at the scope of your game. So in miniatures, um, when you look at Flames of War, you look at um, you look at uh, um, oh, two fat lardies. Chain of Command. Um, you look at Fistful of Lead Bigger Battles. You're playing ostensibly um, platoon level. Platoon up to company level. Depending on, you know, how, you know, you're, you're you not going to get, get, you're not going to get bigger than a company uh, game out of those games without some expansion, so to speak. Yeah. So let, let's go with the company level game. You're the company commander. You do not care if private snuffy is going to be throwing that grenade at that foxhole. You're not going to care that he is aiming his rifle instead of shooting from the hip. You're going to expect him to do what he needs to do to obtain his objective. Now, you might be, okay, I want you to assault, do, do, do a uh, close quarters, you know, close quarters combat. Um, but how that actually plays out don't care if he's got bayonets, don't care if he's using hand grenades, don't care if he's using, you know, butt stocks, whatever. You're just telling that unit, that probably squad or fire team to go do it. So here's here's one of my questions, and I don't know if Jay is quite back yet from putting uh, the second most successful um, member of the family or second most YouTube successful member of the family to sleep yet. But my question is, what of the what a game that I see as having massive potential for accuracy is Kriegspiel. Yes. Because of exactly what it is. It's 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 drawn out to the point where there aren't necessarily mechanics. Or at least okay. In 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 my experiences with Kriegspiel, which are obviously you know limited so your mileage may vary um there's a unique experience or there's a unique possibility for accuracy there because you've got a a a, an umpire or a team of umpires um deciding things and then just feeding you information back so here's my my question for jay can we have one of the most accurate um kriegspiel games ever at uh j3 next year in july we can all put on uncomfortable boots we'll walk for like two and a half hours in july we'll be wearing entirely wool clothing 
and then we'll sit there, get like three quarters lit, just start choking each other with tobacco smoke. And then we'll have to make all these command decisions while sitting inside of a canvas tent, sitting in the middle of, you know, a field in Illinois in the middle of July. And then honestly, the, the last person to not die of dehydration will probably win. So, so I will go out on a limb here and say no, because that's too close to LARPing. <laughs> well, that, that's my other point is if you want action, reenact, like you could do that. Yeah. You can, you can choke on the black powder smoke and feel like shit for a week or so after a long day of reenacting, which is, yeah. I'm not going to lie to you delightfully it i've i've participated in a couple french and indian and civil war reenactments and the civil war reenactments are interesting because there's a huge number of people there um but it's it's fun times it's yeah it's it's good um but yes technically yes you're right <clears throat> larping oh no Let, let's uh God go hit some comments real quick uh chuck says i define balance as one tiger v4 sherman's um, and that's an entirely different conversation as to where you're wrong, Chuck. Um, PZ4 and Stug for great games. I like those. That was a, uh, uh, you know what? PZ4s and Stugs against Shermans and M10s okay. makes a really great game when you're playing, uh, what a tanker by two fat lardies. It does. Um, Roger says, what days, uh, will we do the live streams plans for the weekends or weekdays? Wednesdays is the day for the Not Jay Chronicles. That's the name of this show. Um, Jay Wiley has actually offered to get me uh, splash screens made. I don't know what that means, but that's awesome. The, the little title cards and whatnot. Oh, you know, that's yeah. Awesome. Yeah, because yeah. Jay's awesome and really good at that. Yeah, exactly. Because the kind of thing that if you or I were to try and do that, it would take us like four days and it would look like crap. Jay's and he'll do it in his... four minutes and it'll yeah. be amazing. Yeah, yeah he's going to so. sit down on his lunch break and make all of them be like, oh, here you go, guys. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and Jeff answered uh, Robbie for me and I appreciate that. Thank you, Jeff. That's why I keep you on, buddy. You, 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 we, you do Thursday shows on occasion as well. Uh, upon occasion, yeah. When, when I don't have weird shit I'm going on. Thursdays. You're going to take Thursdays? I can figure out what the heck it is I want to do. Okay. Hey, if you'll if you'll let me be there, I'll I'll be there for you. <clears throat> Always, not Jay. Always. Outstanding. Uh, John here says uh, your expectation of expectation for both sides is that there is a historical result, the result that the game the Germans would win the Battle of, of the Bulge, considering conditions and decisions is nil. Yeah. Exactly. Um, he says, uh, the Germans invasion of Soviet Union, you need to play as if Hitler was in charge, not Manstein, and especially not the player is doing what he or she wants to do. Don't, don't um, you be smudge, Eric. And then Robbie says, uh, great, thank you for letting me know. Looking forward to Wednesdays. Well, you know, Robbie, that that makes me feel good. I, that that makes, me, uh, makes me happy. Uh, sorry, guys, got to run, off to work. Have a great chat. We will, Robbie. Ca catch catch us on the reruns. Comment. Uh, do what you do, man. Uh, and then Chuck says, John, nope, it ain't a sim if you have to do everything that has, was done for real. Um, Jeff says, night, Robbie. And then uh, John says, all rain actors should be required to wear the uniforms that a normal 5'8", 99-pound man. Any gut spillage should be seen. Oh, Lord, no. Oh Lord, no! Um, so you know it's and and Jay is really good at this because he's he's been in the army. Uh, Jeff is probably very aware of this also, uh, and what he says is that you you train your leaders to be two levels up and two levels down in, in knowledge. In other words, you're, if you're the company commander, you are going to be aware of what your platoon leaders. And here we go with the wardrobe himself. Hello. Tom. Wow. What's up? 
So, you know, he, you're going to know what your platoon leaders are responsible for. You're not telling them, you're not telling your platoon leaders or your squad leaders what to do as the company commander, but you're aware of what their objectives are. You've provided them with the objective. Um, it's your platoon leader that is then responsible for making sure the squad leader actually makes sure the squad does what they do. You're also aware of, if you're at the company level, you're, you go from company to battalion, battalion to what brigade, brigade or division, depending on your, your build out regiment, maybe regiment. There you go. Yeah. Battalion regiment. Thank you. God, I can never, rem I can't always forget regiment for some stupid ass reason. You're good. Anyway, you're aware of what the overall objective of the regiment is. Again, you're not responsible for what the regiment is is responsible for. You're responsible for your part, but you're aware of the bigger issue. Gaming is the same way, in my opinion. Um, if I am playing a company-level game, if I am playing in a campaign with other players and I've got a regimental commander... I am going to be aware of what the regiment, you know, what my, my, my gaming buddies are wanting to accomplish. Uh, and then as I'm playing, I just tell my units to go do what they do. And I'm not caring how they propagate the combat. I care about that. They do propagate the combat. They that makes sense. Input. What's that? They ex I, I got some input on this. Yeah, go ahead. So, and I'll let Jay, since Jay is probably still more currently, he can, uh, he can validate this or he can correct how it works now. So I left in 92 and I was, my primary job was in 19 Delta. I was a scout and scout platoons were, you know, would be, a, you know, part of attached, whatever you want to call it to armor battalions, infantry battalions, whatever. Um, and then in cav cavalry, okay. Uh, my last unit was a an air cab unit. Uh, officers, and I like I said, Jay, you'll have to validate this for me, out because I don't know how today if it's still the same way. Officers would come in, for example, to our cavalry squadron, and they would not have. I mean, we get infantry officers, okay. That's how we qualified them. <clears throat> they would do a rotation through certain jobs within the squadron. And I don't know how many times that you know, <clears throat> actually every place I went, I would get an officer, whether he was armor or whether he was infantry, where he honestly had no clue what a scout platoon's abilities were or what their priority task of uh, reconnaissance security was. They really had no grasp of it. And I don't know how many times I spent probably the first six months of a new officer taking over as a platoon leader of a scout platoon, having to spend six months and say, hey, we, we don't function like infantry. We don't function like tank, like a tank platoon or a tank company. And, and of course, you can always tell when you when when I hit that four to six month period, if they started to see our routines the way they were designed to be, you knew you had a good one. And then sure enough, within a year, they took him and they sent his ass to be the maintenance officer or something like that. So I don't know. Jay can probably validate whether that's still the process nowadays inside units or not. But training up and down is, you know, so me as a platoon sergeant, I answered to my platoon leader. All right. And at the same time, though, I was training my platoon leader, the guy who was in charge of all of us on how what our tactical abilities were and how we executed certain tasks. And then at the same time, <clears throat> he would pass down things to me, whether he was infantry or armor. Maybe he wasn't passing down to me how reconnaissance was supposed to be done, but he was teaching me what those units that were behind me, what their capabilities were, which made me stronger at what I did. Right. So, um, I think, again, when it comes to miniature gaming, you you can take just about any quote historical game and make it 
somewhat historically accurate um, based off of the toys that they provide for you to play with uh, and not follow necessarily all the rules that they provide that, you know, that they give you a uh, perfect example is, you know, I, I don't remember the game I played, but there was one where I was playing as a battalion commander, but I had to keep track of what type of round and how many of those rounds had been fired by that tank right there. As a battalion commander, I should not need to know, nor should I want to know, how many rounds that tank has and whether it fired a Sabo or a Heat or whatever. I'm telling that tank's platoon or that tank's company as a battalion commander, go take Objective Hill 319. Or cover the infantry taking Hill 319. I don't care that this tank fired at that tank with a Sabo. And that's where a lot of people get into, oh, but it's so realistic. Is it, though? Exactly. As a battalion commander, it's not realistic at all. Because a battalion commander would not know that information, nor does he want to know that information. A e Even to the point of, honestly, a company commander isn't going to care. Your platoon commander isn't going to care unless it's his tank that he's fighting. I'm listening to Team Yankee right now. Just started um, one of my favorite books. And I'm th and, I, and I'm thinking about okay, what game would best suit me playing a team sized force against the opposition? Invariably, I run into games that will have NATO forces have a company sized uh, unit fighting a Soviet or war pack battalion sized unit almost invariably for, for whatever reason, I guess they just don't like the idea that a M60 platoon or M an M60 platoon is five tanks and an M60 company is 17 tanks versus a company of Soviets, which is only 10. You know, th three tanks to a uh, platoon, ten tanks to a company. I guess they just, they don't like that because it doesn't have enough toys. I don't know. I, and, I, you know, I wasn't in an armored unit. I was in Camo for the brief amount of time I was in. So I don't know what the expectations were of a company-sized force. You know, were they expected to take on? A Soviet Keep battalion is working, huh? Keep our damn radios working. Yeah, that, that's that was, that's what I was supposed to do. I was supposed to make sure the net stayed up, you know. So I don't know if that you know company of of infantry in their M two Bradleys or M three Bradleys were supposed to be taking on a company of of BRDMs or a battalion of BRDMs. I don't know. So I don't know how, quote, accurate that always seems to be. Um, but again, it's, you know, I can play, um, I, I can play just about any um, miniatures game to be historically accurate as long as I make sure that when I'm commanding my unit that I'm not having to be nitpicky about what type of rounds they're shooting unless I'm, you know, actually the tank commander or whatever. Um, I think, and, and this is why I'm glad Todd and, and Jeff are here and to, uh, uh, to some extent, um, McMurray is on board games. 
where are are there board games that focus more on the ABCs of the process to get to the result? And then are there games that we don't worry about the ABCs, we just worry about here's our result. Is is there a difference in those ga- in those type of games, or you know, are there games that go one way or the other? Oh, I mean, yeah, I mean, they, certainly there are ones that go into way more uh, detail for command and control, and those that really abstract it out. You know, I mean, SCS, which is McMurray's uh, game board game of choice at the moment. Um, and all of us are enjoying it. It's pretty abstract, and they simplify a lot of that stuff. And which, what, which game? Oh, I'm sorry, Standard Combat Series. So that's pretty much what you've seen McMurray playing a lot of. Okay. World War II, primarily he did World War One, Rock of the Marne. So it's 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 more concerned with the result of the interaction between the two sides. As compared to, you know, figuring out that I'm going to go in depth as to how we're propagating the combat. There, yeah. There's more abstraction. So oh, yeah. I get probably, and I don't want to say the most abstract, but the most abstract when it comes to combat in a board game would be checkers. Right. Or, or chess. And even chess is not as abstract as checkers, but as you know, when you think about a board, an abstracted board game, at least in, in my thought is the commands and colors. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Uh, um, line of games, whether it's memoir 44 or command and colors, ancients or tricolor or, or tricorn or whatever it's called. Yep. It is, it gives a historically viable result, but doesn't get you into the weeds. Right. Exactly. Um, well, compared to game that does get you. And in, in, I mean, okay. So I have not played squad leader. Obviously Todd does. Todd's got the experience. Yeah. It. And if you've got, okay. Okay. So I'm assuming that a, a squad leader in the game can affect the fire ability of, let's say, an, an MG42 unit, all right? Yeah, right. A guy, yeah. A, a guy shooting and a guy loading. And yep. The ammo. But does that leader affect – I mean, does the game account for uh, that leader affecting that the ammo guy tripped over a rock and never got the new ammunition – into the gunner, you know, to, you know, I mean, you know, when you want to go down, I, there's nothing down. I don't think at that level, I think the, the closest thing games come to would be that is, Hey, if he's within this range, we're going to get a plus one for shooting. Yeah. You have to be in the hex yeah. for that. For and that's probably well. about where it stops. I can't think of any other game that could go well beyond, you know, uh, probably you could probably like uh, those where it gets down to man to man. So firepower, um, uh, what's that? Ranger, I think, is one. Uh, maybe ambush, where it's you're just leading a squad. Perhaps it might do that. What's there's another one, a very new one that was recently put out that was more like you're up, you're running a squad. So there, you're probably getting that sort of thing. But yeah, I mean, squad leader, of course, you know, 150 pages of rules. But but even that abstract stuff out, right? Even sure. But um, but but then people do complain that that doesn't really have good command and control because. Basically, all that squad leader, not all, these leaders do a lot of stuff. But the leader can rally the men and the troops and can affect their firepower and probably a lot of million other things that I'm certainly leaving out. But you can move those units all over the place. You can have like one squad here and 50 squads on this side. And, you know, and that's like, what? That's not, that's not realistic. And, but they just, command and control wasn't something they put in that game as much like that. Obviously, there's a ton of detail. And I'm sure I'm abstracting a lot. So if you know ASL really well, be, be forgiving, please. But um, so even that de- super detailed game has abstracted stuff out for playability purposes. 
but they are important. You can't rally without those leaders. So yeah, see, you could take you could take today's era of combat soldier, and with everybody wearing a radio in their ear, I mean, throughout the entire squad on occasions, you could really go into some depth for command and control in a game of that, you know, where you're accounting for it. Got, hey, this guy's radio is down or, you know, he's too far away for that squad leader to yell at him or something like that. But I mean, I can't, I mean, I don't know how deep you could go going back in time where you didn't, I mean, you know, weren't the Germans like on the East front? I mean, the Russians really, they didn't even have communication systems throughout platoons initially. And I'm not even sure how deep they were towards the end, but I think didn't the Germans have, the Germans had that ability. So, I mean, to me, there's command and control difference right there. If you, you're going to put, uh, if, if you're doing an armor version inside squad leader works, so it's a tank, tanks on tank battle. I mean, right there, you, you're, I'm, I mean, you're telling me, okay, well, my Germans are going to have better fire and control than the Soviet units they're facing. Yeah, they do actually have it. Like in early war, they do have radio and non-radio differences. So they do reflect that. And again, that's that's something you you can go down the alley two ways. You can abstract that out by giving a, a bonus to I don't know to to something if you if you've got better radio. Well, I guess a perfect example is you know the Americans and uh, having a special rule of uh, like in Flames of War the time on target rule for your artillery. What, why why do the Americans get a bonus in artillery um, when they you know quote hit on the first die roll on artillery? Well, it's because because every platoon leader has a handy talkie and you can yeah. communicate directly to. You're not worrying about talking to battalion command. Get exactly, exactly. It's, it's because the, the 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 Americans trained. Which is a really cool thing that see. That what? Hello? We lost you there. Calling calling for fire in today's military back help back in the eighties when I was in. That was that was that was not a that was not specific to combat line soldiers. Every soldier had to learn how to call. What well, maybe at different levels, but I mean every private I had in a scout platoon, I mean just fresh out of basic and AIT they had the general knowledge of how to call indirect fire. And then we just, right. So, I mean, but as a, and I gotta, I, you gotta say other than like, say the, the route of communications during world war two, that with the philosophy, the Germans had of, you know what, and you were talking about earlier, go do this. Okay. But I'm not going to tell you how to do this. You take them in. Those squad leaders worked hard. Those German squad leaders were extremely efficient on the, on the, on the front line where, the difference is now is is that I know when we would go out on a mission, I would have if I had indirect fire that was specifically assigned to the mission I was on, they I there was a radio frequency that I could talk directly to them and get instantaneous fire. Yeah. But if you like I say, as you go back through time, that necessarily wasn't there. You know, Billy Bob squad leader on the front line, you know, we see it in movies and where it's not very accurate. Right? But I watched a good movie last night that actually depicted a Vietnam situation where uh, an entire company in combat, each of the, the platoons had to relay through that company commander and that company commander had, had a, a, a guy that was calling fire over the radio, but all the traffic that those three platoons needed had to come through that company commander and that company commander's indirect guy or their caller, he would have to make the calls to the battery. So you, you there's a lapse in time where right with stuff assigned to your mission, you're going to get indirect fire or air support, close air, whatever on the spot. If you go back through time, and you imagine how long it would have took to get, get a, a German squad on the front line to get artillery from a divisional asset or a core asset if it wasn't pre-programmed. It'll right. go boom, boom tomorrow. What was that? It'll go boom, boom tomorrow. Right, right. So, but it's just... Again, it's a it's a process. Uh, um, the the again, it's a, it's a matter of do you want to 
run through the process of, you know, I, I'm I'm a, a, a platoon commander. Do I want to roll to see if I communicate back to my company commander? Then do I want to roll to see if my company commander uh, has his guy call to the uh, fire control center? Um, and then do they, you know, plot it properly? Or do I just want to say, hey, I'm calling in artillery? You know, uh, either way, you know, do, do I get to the same, do I get to the same place? I'm uh, going to go back and take a look at some uh, comments here. Uh, John Longshore says, I was a better commander and no training and running a battalion other than shut up, Captain, and go back to your now platoon. Nice. Uh, officer training was generally reserved for military schools, OJT, yeah, at the level uh, you were working. Uh, I.e. Civil War, an excellent division commander was generally 90% of the time a shitty corps commander. Mm. Uh, and and I, I'll leave that up to uh, Jeff to to ruminate on. Um, Napoleonic's player wants to do everything, but in reality, a division commander going down to tell a battalion to form square only happened in, a, in fancy novels. A battalion commander knows what to do when. Exactly. Yeah, th and that's exactly what I'm talking about. <clears throat> if you are a division commander, you are more concerned about getting, if we're talking Napoleonic's, getting hay for my horses, food for my people, and bullets for my guns. To be perfectly honest, that's what, you know, the division commander, and he's not personally worrying about that. He's, he's got the staff to worry about that, but that is his concern. His concern is not whether, you know, the third battalion is forming up a square when it's being charged by, the light brigade. And yes, I know that's a completely different war. Sue me. Um, it also goes on and says mousetrap. The commander is the marble, the subordinate in charge of the rocket that, uh, to nail the plastic mouse. Yes. I had that game and many war might throws in a lol. Oh, lol. So, um, so, I mean, as Jay said early on, they are not mutually exclusive, and, and, I, and I'm I'm never going to be one to say that they are. They should be mutually exclusive. You can have historical accuracy and high playability at the same time. You just have to know which <clears throat> which type of playability do you want. Do you want to be uh, the guy who is um, worrying about supply getting to you? Then don't play a company level game. If you want to be worried about, you know, what round that tank fired, don't play a battalion or even a company level game. Um, so I think that in lies the, the true essence of, of playability and accuracy. You know, if you, you can have it be both, you just need to figure out what, what accuracy do you really want? Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, some people think Goss is super playable or campaign for North Africa, right? I mean, this just depends on what level you, Whereas I think that's not very playable. I mean, I've got Goss. I'm going to learn it, but you know, SCS is a lot more playable. So it depends on your uh, tolerance yeah. for that kind of thing, too. Um, I, I can tell you that I I've I've owned two uh, different Cold War board games. Uh, technically three, but two of them are essentially the the same. They've got the same DNA. World at War and World at War 85, essentially the same game with World at War 85 being cleaned up. And Team Yankee. I've, I never got to play Team Yankee, 
because I couldn't get through the rules because it did seem to be rather. Oh, r r rather. And I was, I don't want to say crunchy as a, as a derogatory term here, because there can be crunchy games that are still very playable. Um, but it was crunchy in a bad way. Well, Again, yeah, some, you were some, some games just aren't good, well written. Period. Yeah, crunchy or um, simple, there's not well written. So, war, what I like about World of War eighty five is that it provides me with a quote historically plausible outcome, and it's just a matter of how do you want to get to that outcome. Um, and that I guess that in 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 lies the the you know actually you can, you can have both you know you, you can have a historically you historically viable outcome with a high level accuracy and still have it be playable um, yeah. let's see more comments um, John says he actually doesn't know how to play Mousetrap. Uh, Jeff wants to know uh, what's the next Hicks Encounter game that you're purchasing. Uh, just trying to stir the shit, aren't you, uh, Jeff? Uh, World War One, where companies had zero input to artillery support other than their watch and hoping the batteries ha also had a watch. True that. Uh, pst, hey, bite me. Yeah, uh, I choose life. Nice. <laughs> uh, he says you live in Arizona. Um, you mean you choose undead? Yes, he does. He chooses undead quite a bit. Uh, it's hot as hell, and sure hope the hacienda doesn't spontaneously combust. Thumbs up. Uh, Michigan, the only state not visited by the four horsemen of the apocalypse, unless you're looking for water. Uh, and Nestle Crunch Bar sounds good. DQ? Oh, God. You're killing me. So. All righty. Well, we probably have uh, beaten this horse to death. Unless y'all have some more input on it. I do not. What? All right. What? Play post, Captain. Age of, sale, age of sale, friends. Play post, Captain. It's good. Okay. It's a good balance. All right. So I'm going to do something that had been promised over and over and over and over and over and over again over at the War Room. Oh. We're going to take a look at this real quick. Regina Marina Fleet. Victory at Sea. Sweet. By Warlord Games. Uh, oh. It's uh, eight resin and metal model ships. And we'll dig into those here real quick. Sweet. Not going to take a whole lot of time. But um, we've got one tag by from IEVA. I guess that's how that's pronounced. And uh, we're going to start off with Looks like the little guys here. All right. Y'all seeing this okay? Ah, there we go. Yeah, you should make your screen big. Make your screen yeah. the only one. I'm, I'm doing, doing that right now. Mugs. Doing that right now. All right. That's pretty good. This is a... What the hell is this? This is the navigatory class destroyer. Got three of them in here. Pretty nice. Pretty nice. Well sculpted. Going to need a little bit of the cleanup here on from the resin uh, pour, but that's okay. Uh, if I remember correctly, the navigatory class was like one of the fastest destroyers out there. Mm. I think in World War II, they could get close to 40 knots. Were they made? They, were they built by Ferrari? Uh, yes, yes, they were. 
kind of like the yeah, Jesus, the Fiat 3000. We were like, oh, what if we made this FT17 go really, really fast? How cool would that be? No, we still lost the war. Anyway. Um, I Eva... I even looked at packaged this one also. We've got a couple of cruisers here. Um, this one is the holy crap! Hold on, the Etna class cr cruiser. The one thing I can say about the Italians is they had very pretty ships. They did, and they painted them really light gray, which was really pretty in the Mediterranean sunlight. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, those look pretty decent. A little bit of cleanup there, but not too bad. And these are the ones with the metal uh, turrets and stuff? Yes. Yeah, they'll have metal turrets. Um, this is the Zara-class cruiser. Oh, yeah, that looks pretty good. Zara and Polar are beautiful. They're, they're good-looking ships. Yeah. The bases piss me off, but whatever. Yeah. They piss everybody off. Yeah, they do. Um, <clears throat> how do, do you glue the turrets in there, or do you keep them loose? No, I'll, I'll glue them. I glue, yeah. This is the uh, Kodoma class. It's uh, Luigi... Oh, Cardona. Uh, Luigi? Luigi Cardona. Luigi Kardashian. Okay, cool. And I got some. I, I, what I like about the Italian ships are those red and white stripes on there. I was, I, I, when I painted ships, those were fun to paint on there. Yeah. And they looked really <laughs> cool. Yeah, the aircraft recognition. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, you know, they wouldn't be bombed by their own aircraft. Which is hilarious because the Italians didn't have a fleet air arm, anyways. But yeah. yeah. You know, we don't need to get into the details. Um, the metal was actually packed by Is it Radka? No, Laura. Oh wow. Um and we've got the battleship Conte de Cavour. Mm. De Cavour. There we go. Very pretty ship. I said um, the, the Italian Navy was fast. Uh, by all by all rights, it was a first class uh, navy. I mean, it wasn't big, but you know, it, it could go toe to toe quite easily. That's eh, a little better. Uh, it could go toe to toe quite easily. It you know, in the books at least. Uh, it right. can go up against the British Mediterranean fleet. Except for when you came to actual combat. Well, there is that. And then all of a sudden you have Mattapan. Well. Like that. <clears throat> or Pearl Harbor Part 1, a.k.a. Taranto. Yeah. Uh, and then their carrier, the Aquila. That cool. pisses me off so much that what? one more waste time when they could put in good-looking, accurate ships instead they put in german fucking aircraft carriers and italian aircraft carriers like what the what yeah are you smoking what yeah are you sh sh ships well how high are you people right now again it it, it 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 really goes back to uh goes back to stupidity accuracy to playability and, and in their case not so much playability but what will sell sellability you know, no, I'm, I'm like 90% sure that they water in an angry thing. I'm pretty sure it was completed, was under construction. Yeah. And then got blown up by the Italians after the Italians surrendered and it was seized by the Germans. Probably so. I'm pretty sure it was a conversion. You know what? I'm just going to look it up. Hang on. Yeah. Uh, yep, yep. It was scuttled. Of course, it was. Yeah, exactly. Why? Why is this here? Why is there a German aircraft carrier in that game? It's not that hard to just abstract. Okay, these planes come from off the board. Exactly. Oh yeah, and it does have aircraft. 
And the aircraft are supposed to be... Uh, what? Okay, that's wrong. There's no Mitsubishi nothing in Italy. What'd you say? There's no Mitsubishi anything in Italy. No way. They put Mitsubishi planes in an Italian box? Well, it says Mitsubishi Reggiane RE2001 Falco 2 flights. Huh. I think the Mitsubishi was a copy-paste error. Someone should be someone should be losing their job. I'm just saying. Somebody should just their boss needs to walk into their office to go, Doug. Rather, whoever is supposed to be approving this stuff, someone needs to walk and be like, Are you the dumbest person ever? Right. That halfway sounds like some minions making cards like this is dumb. I wonder if they'll catch this. Yeah. Um so and these are uh, honestly I can't tell the difference between these and the other airplanes. Those in a Mitsubishi? <laughs> yeah. Which I own now. I, I have a Mitsubishi. Uh -huh. Those are always my favorite joke memes when people like message Porsche, hey, do you guys carry everything in the Porsche line? And then they'll send like an elephant, like I want one of these. Right. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> well, see, I... Donna likes to name her cars. Fair enough. She didn't like the name I thought of for the Mitsubishi. What was it? Zeke. Zeke. I, yeah. I would have named my my shitty Civic uh, Corsair and just run right into the back of you. Nice. Nice. Uh, no, but... Uh, <clears throat> The, the Americans called the Mitsubishi A6M Zero yeah. the Zeke. The Zeke. Uh, yeah. I thought it was clever. She, yeah. however, did not. She was not on board. She has yet to come up with a name, though. You start, oh. you I'm like, just going to start calling it Zeke. I was about to say, maybe like a dog, when somebody can't come up with their dog's name, so you just start calling the dog something, and then eventually that's all it aces to. Yeah, exactly. That's where we're going with that. Perfect. Um, I see. Let's go ahead and. Uh, you, know, you said there were Falcos in there. Are there Fulgors, the Machis? No. Or is it just the one type of airplane? It's just the one type of airplane. That supposedly it goes on the aircraft carrier, which didn't exist. Well, it existed, but. As a block ship? Yeah. <clears throat> um, let's see. More about accuracy and playability always works in my world. Well, you know what? And, and that, again, um, when you are playing a non historical game, such as zombies, such as Star Wars, such as SG1. There is no historical accuracy to deal with. So you can yeah, make it whatever you want. That's that's oh, what I really like Christ. about that. Christ sake. Eat a bag of dicks, Warlord. <laughs> what now? I got on their website to see, you know, to look at the contents of this thing. They want $144 for eight, eight crafts. Three of which are destroyers that would cost five dollars for the three of them if you bought them anywhere else. Eat yeah, a bag of dicks. I'm not saying it's a great price. No, you're good. I just that I thought I was like, oh, this is probably like eighty bucks. Nope, it's almost no. twice that. Yep. What yep. the actual? Well, I mean oh, that is historically accurate. What ships are a lot more expensive than what you expect them to be. This isn't this isn't the U.S. in the interwar period. Like we're not again. This isn't the U.S. Navy where it's like, oh, we're not in a war. We don't need a navy anymore. Bye. Right, uh, John. No, just these, these are Tillman no. battleships. Although that would be super cool to see somebody make a model of Tillman battleships. There you go. Uh, top sixteen clown names. No, no, 
first off, we're not going to do top 16 saying off. If we did, it wouldn't be clowns. Top 16 clown names. Uh, me, me, warm up says, did someone uh, type top 16 yet? Yeah, no, they didn't. Um, the water level looks similar to USS monitor. Right. Yeah. On, uh, <laughs> oh, on yep. the, uh, the, those destroyers. Yes. Uh, the, the water, the, the, the freeboard on those uh, destroyers was not the greatest. They would not have done well in the uh, in the Atlantic. We'll just so say that. The fun part, right, with all of those models, is the freeboard in all of them looks absurdly small. But when you look at Italian destroyers, they were built to go really fast, so they yeah. have high bows. They have yep. high bows. They don't have their 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 halfways, right? They're not flush decked. But they no. have the house they're designed to go really fast. Yep. Right? So they need that. It's frustrating. Uh, couldn't name a single Soviet ship, but I'm banking on the Lenin and the Potemkin. Um, no and no. Marat. Marat is a, uh, a Soviet ship. That's got a fun fun story yep. behind it. Um, John, and also, if it's a game I have to get on the floor with, then I'm off to the lobby to get myself a drink. Well, the good thing is I've got a table big enough for these suckers. So now the fact that they expect you to play this game and you use this on a four foot by six foot table, you're on crack. Um, I still want to know whose line of molds they bought for this because it looks like they bought like a line of, uh, you know, like gift shop models because they got the, you know, fancy base and the name on them and all that. Right. <clears throat> yeah. It's one of those, like, come on, man. Like, Warlord had a good name and a good reputation built up with all of their, you know, bolt action lines and, and their ancients and black yeah. powder lines and all that stuff. And then they started just doing dumb clown shoe shit like this. And it's one of those, come on, man. What is going or, on? Uh, SPQR. Well, again, SPQR, that's one of those, whatever, man. You had a bad rule book. In their defense, they took SPQR, they re released new rules, and they made them cheap for people who yeah. had the old rules and got burned on that. Should they do the same thing with Cruel Seas? Probably. Is Cruel yep. Seas to a lesser extent in the same, what are you guys doing with your models vote as this game? Absolutely. Yep. Was it interesting to see Warlord double down on there? We're going to make dumb models in a dumb scale. Or we're going to make quality models in a dumb scale that have obvious massive flaws. Because that was the issue with Cruel Seas. And so when Victory at Sea, they announced, everybody was like, oh, this is cool. Maybe they'll fix that. Nope. Even worse. Bam. Check it out. Come on, man. So, uh, John says they're using the same plan model for every nation. No, actually they're not. They, they are. There is a there is a difference between the aircraft, but you've got to get really close to them to to see the difference. And honestly, if they decided to use just a generic single wing fighter for every nation, but they fixed the ships, I would be delighted. I wouldn't care at all. Yeah, that that'd be fine with me, John. I wouldn't mind that at all. But instead, they made the ships all dumb and ugly and. Yep. They're not bad. The ships themselves don't look bad. It's the fact that they're on these great big stupid bases. This right here. That are warped as fuck. And I'll, like so on mine, I bought the uh, I bought the Latorio right because it was on sale at miniature market. Dent and ding. I think I paid like ten bucks. I was like, okay, it's a decent looking model. That's fine. It is warped to Christ. Everybody's like, no, it just looks like that. It just looks like that because of how they're made. No, it's super, super warped. Yeah. Somebody was on here on a live stream on one of these channels and told me it wasn't super warped, so I just went and got a straight edge and put it on top of it. That is warped. Yeah, but mine is warped the opposite direction. It's concave because when they oh. did the casting... Oh, like oh, this? Yeah, it's super concave. Like The casting itself is noticeably thinner in the center than it is on the ends. And it's just hmm. one of those, no, 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 this isn't a, like, this is an issue with how you guys make your stuff, and then it's a huge, and it's a QC issue. It's right. Just, it's just one of those, like, dude, this, there's a reason that there's no one else in the naval miniatures market 
that puts out castings on stupid bases like this. Right. There's a exactly. very, very, very good reason that no one does this. There's a good reason that this isn't the industry standard. Oh. Sorry, I'm going off on a on a thing again. I apologize. Yeah, it's okay. This is another one of those warlords going to watch the first two minutes of review and be like, wow, this is amazing because they didn't get to McMurray taking a dump all over it in the last five minutes. Yeah, you know what? I, I owe nothing to Warlord. Again, the ship models are gorgeous. The fact that they put them on those stupid bases is just one of those like, wow, this is this is super fantastic. Like imagine getting a Ferrari and putting like, you know. Treads on it. No, even dumber than that, like putting like wagon wheels that you bought at Cracker Barrel on it. <laughs> like, this is really cool. Oh, no, never mind. It's pointless. Right. We just screwed up everything. And Todd and Jeff are both muted and probably have us on mute as well, which makes sense. Well, I muted Todd because um, for whatever reason, he's being very noisy tonight. His microphone is like picking up everything. It's like a Hoover. Picks up everything on the first pass. There you go. Oh, that's bad. How do you pack it? What are you packing up, buddy? What are you packing up, Toddy? Normandy, man. You're packing it up? I have to. I got, yeah, I got, well, I got big stuff going on here. Yeah, he, it, he's packing up because it's got to go. You need it, my address for that game, Tom? Yep, the lease is up, Jeff. It's on to you now. <laughs> yeah, I got the address, and it's in uh, St. Louis, and it's going with me. So, uh... yeah, Toddles is. Uh... I don't know, Todd. If that that house is a da- that house that you posted in in the group is a downsize, the house that you live in now must be ginormous. Well, I don't have half an acre I'm living on. That's one downsize. Yeah, that's it true. Zero, it has zero yard. Hey, at least you don't have to mow it now. I know that's a huge downsize. Um. I won't have a six by eight table. Won't be this game room. <laughs> bye bye game room. I don't know. That, that basement was pretty big, or did the wife already claim that? Uh, we're not going to use the basement for it. It's too out in the open. I mean, it's like where you come in. It'll be our movie room. Oh, okay, okay. It's pretty small, actually. It's ten by ten or something. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, whatever. I mean, small is relative, but right. Yeah, because I'm I'm in a room that is well, crap. I think maybe. 10 foot by 8 foot. I think prisoners have more room than I do. <laughs> no, I'm excited about it. Oh, it's it's just going to be two to three months of minus game. I'm going to do a little video saying, okay, everybody, we'll see you in two or three months. Bye. Yeah. Bye. See, see you at Christmas. Yeah. Cool. It's going to be good, though. I'm going to be close to McMurray. Yeah, dude. A lot of gaming going on. There you go. Chris, I'm uh, uh I'm sorry, not Jay. Wait, I'm, wait. Uh, I'm probably five minutes from game night on Sadie Oh yeah? Yeah. Eighty what is it? Eighty three eighty or eighty eighty three? I think it's eighty three eighty. Yeah, eighty three eighty Washington Road. Yep. There you go, man. I could walk there very easily. Well, I can't. So um, oh, that ne- next time I I I I motor that way, I'll uh, yeah, please do. Let me. you guys know, and we can meet up like we've done a couple of times with uh, Mr. McMurray. It'll be a meet up from the Schmeet up. Um, yeah, next time I get out there, I'll hook up too with y'all. Probably twenty minutes to miniature market. Um, on Manchester. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Not too shabby. Of course, you, that does put you about another 30 minutes away from me, but, you know, that's okay. Not, that wasn't on purpose. <clears throat> <clears throat> Jackass. So, well, guys, um, got about an hour and 20 minutes in. Ooh, good. Um, I wanted to thank you all again for, for showing up and working with me. No idea what next week's going to, what we're going to be talking about next week. Um, I didn't know what I was going to talk about tonight until like, I don't know, five thirty. Perfect. So, um, if, if, if any of you guys, whether the three of y'all that are on here live with me or any of the six of you watching has 
any idea on what we can uh, yammer about uh, or what you would like for us to talk about, you know, uh, you know, drop me a line. Let's see. Call it a Betty. Uh, I named the wife's cars based on how long before she totals it. Nice. Um, old black Betty. Bang a wall. Yeah. Uh, could be complete. One six hundred scale wooden victory complete with brass cannons and full rigging for the price of that kit. Yeah, you could. So, um, yeah, we can talk about Warmut and, and how silly it is for living in Arizona and being a lawn expert in Arizona. Well, that sounds like the ultimate, like, he's, he's, he's a genius. He's selling yeah. lawns to people in Arizona. Yeah. He's a genius. Um, so, but, uh, yeah, anybody, you know, if y'all, you know, have any idea of what to – what to talk about or what y'all want to hear us talk about, um, you know, let us know. Um, I, I'm very amenable to taking your, uh, your suggestions because, you know, this is, this is still new. Uh, you know, we're still 40, you know, only 48 of us in this community. I'd like to grow it. You know, He's in the constant battle to stay ahead of his nephew. So let's help him out here, people. So, but uh, again, thanks again. We will see you definitely next Wednesday. Um, once Jeff figures out what the hell he wants to do, he's going to go Thursday nights. Um, and then every other Tuesday is uh, BSing with the Baron and Steve. Which is awesome. Everybody definitely, definitely got to check that out. Um, uh, probably my uh, um, probably my f favorite part of the show is the dumbass mailbag. Um, like last night, um, dumbass mailbag was he received the email that literal this is literally verbatim. How do I get a hold of you? <clears throat> That's the email he received. <laughs> Even Jeff is palm, yeah. head and palm. Yeah. So I I love dumbass mailbag. That's great. Uh, on BS and with the Baron and Steve. Every other Thursday, so not or every other Tuesday, so not this coming Tuesday, but the following Tuesday. Um, Mick Murray. Um just a heads up. Next a week from tomorrow is their next miniatures game night. Okay. Just letting you know so you don't show up on the wrong night. That's fair. So that's the 16th then. Or no, the night. Whoa, whoa. What are you saying? Hold on. What's happening? The night. Um, so Mc McMurray has made the promise that one of the Thursday night games – He's going to hightail his ass out to Kansas City, to Independence, uh, and show up on uh, the doorstep. Jay Wiley's doorstep, saying, "Hi, I'm here to play." And the thing, leave. the thing is, is one Thursday night is miniature night. Every other Thursday night is RPG night. Oh, yeah. I hope he shows up for RPG night. Why would you put that evil on me, Todd? <laughs> Uh, are you, uh, what are you going to be tonight, Jeff McMurray? A paladin or a uh, dwarf? Why not a dwarf paladin? He's going to be a bard, a bard ranger rogue. Yeah, there you go. I'm going to be a fish level uh, magic caster. Uh, uh, by the way, I just joined in a role playing game two weeks ago, so I do it willingly. What what what, what uh, game are you playing? Uh, uh -oh. School Essentials. All right. Old school essentials. Well, uh, McMurray, I might have some stuff for you to deliver, but we know that. All right. This is. Oh, yo. So. All right. So, again, we'll uh, hmm. talk to y'all later. Y'all right. have a uh, 
great night and uh, definitely see y'all next Wednesday. All right. Thanks for having me on. Cool. Glad to have you.